Welcome to Keto and Crime and Thought Crime. Today, I have a long one for you, but a goodie. Today, I am delving head first into the Jody Arias case from 2008 through 2015, when it was fin finally sort of settled. There have been new developments, which I will tell you about at the end of this, but I just wanted to warn you, this will be a long one. It will probably be a three to four parter, but I will get them to you one, you know, right in order. You won't have to wait a week or anything. It'll be like right in order. So I'm going to break this down into four different parts. I'm going to break it down into Travis's background, who was the victim, uh, died at the age of 30, very tragic. Jody, the killer, now convicted killer, uh, her background that I'm going to talk about their relationship and <clears throat> subsequent buildup. And then I'm going to talk about the crime itself, the trial, the sentencing, all of that good stuff right after. So with that being said, I'm not going to waste too much time. I just want to say always thank you to my wonderful, wonderful uh, patrons and channel members. Without you, this channel would not be able to, I would not be able to do as much because would not be able to, to to afford the things that I can do to put back into the channel. So I really appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. If you'd like to join them, links are down below. If you'd like to otherwise support the channel, please subscribe. If you have not, I hope today's the day I earn your subscription. Also, you can share, comment. I, I had a wonderful 2020, given that 2020 was a dumpster fire. But... Overall on the channel, we had a good year here, so I'm glad that you guys are here, and I ho I'm glad that you enjoy listening to me tell these stories. And with that being said, also one warning, I will be playing the 911 call when, we, when it gets to that point, so I will put the timestamp, so I know a lot of you don't like to hear things like that. Also, I will not be showing any actual crime scene photos because Susan and the YouTube overlords don't like that, so I will not be showing any crime scene photos. Uh, however, you can easily find them online. They are some of the most gruesome I've ever seen. So, you know, definitely uh, uh, viewer discretion. Uh, and with that being said, let's dive into it. Part one, background of the victim, Travis Alexander. Before I start, I want to say a shout out to everything that I used as a source for this. I will have those all below. I read the book Picture Perfect, a tragic story, a beautiful photographer, her Mormon Lover and a Brutal Murder by Shannon Hogan. I listened to it on Audible, narr narrated by Emily Durant. It is a long one. It takes you about 11 hours to listen to it, but it is very much in depth on both of them. Skewed against Jody, as I think it should be, because she killed someone, but still a great, great, great read. Uh, I also watched the uh, Lifetime movie, uh, Jody Arias, uh, Dirty Little Secret. Highly dramatized, uh, not very accurate at all when it comes to facts. If you've seen that movie, I'd be interested to know what you think of it compared to what I'm about to tell you. Let me know down below. Also, I listen to uh, podcasts and uh, videos by uh, Kendall Ray, great YouTuber. Link her below. Stephanie Harlow, you know she's one of my favorites down below. I love you, Stephanie. I want to collab someday. And uh, also another of my favorite, they're also here on YouTube, but more well-known in the podcasting world, Jill, Jill and Dick from uh, True Crime Brewery, uh, one of the best podcasts out there. I, I can only hope to walk in the same room and breathe the same air as they do. But I'm going to link all of that below, as well as numerous newscasts, news articles, lots of stuff, but I'm going to put the main things below. Anyway, let's get started on Travis. <music> Travis Victor Alexander was born July 28, 1977 in Riverside, California, which is a small blue-collar working-class community uh, about an hour and a half to two hours southwest of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, 
there it's a spotty area even today there are nicer parts of it and not so nice parts of it um i will tell you right now they did not live in the nicest part of it he was one of eight children uh, born to gary david alexander and pamela elizabeth morgan later alexander so I will preface this by saying that Travis had a very, very awful childhood, at least until he was taken in by his, his grandparents. But it, it's very tragic, and the fact that he turned out so well is a testament to the human spirit it's what, itself. I will also say that this crime was truly preventable, and I don't hold, even though, of course, Jody Arias is the one I hold most accountable but I also have to kind of put blame where it lies. And so some of it has to be kind of leaped on uh, Travis as well, because um, his behavior was not exactly correct in uh, what he did and the things that he sort of did to push Jody to that point. Now, do I think Jody Arias would have eventually killed someone had it not been for Travis Alexander? Probably because she was extremely unstable and had a lot of issues on her own. But I think if Travis had cut his losses and got out a lot sooner, that he would still be with us. And we lost a very wonderful person that had a lot of good things to give still at the age of 30. So I just want to preface that. But let's get back into his background. Travis was the third son after Gary Jr., Greg. He was followed by sisters Tanisha, Samantha, Hillary, Allie, and another brother named Stephen. Um, they, they lived together in a very decrepit ramshackle house in Riverside. Uh, both of his parents were meth addicts, addicted to methamphetamine. Uh, his father was basically in and out of the picture until he eventually deserted the family entirely uh, when Travis was just four or five years old and Pamela never quite conquered her addiction. She spent most of her time either looking for drugs, high on drugs, and then, and then crashing from the high of the drugs. If you know anything about methamphetamine, you know it speeds you up and put you in this euphoric state. And then the crash, when it occurs, is is all, is one of the lowest lows you will ever have. I've talked to people that have actually, uh, are dealing with their own meth addiction, and that's what they tell me. In addition to it, just beating down your body. So she would be on a search for the drug, she would do whatever she had to do to get the drug, then she would be on wheat loan benders on the drug, and then she would sleep for a week. And if any of the children tried to wake her up to do anything like uh, cook for them, uh, help clean the house, if somebody was hurt, she would beat them. Travis is said, to, because Travis started writing his own book, which we will talk about. I'd be interested to know if anybody's ever going to publish what there is of it. But in his book and his diaries and his memoirs, he wrote that he learned when he had to wake up his mother. He kind of assumed the role of caregiver over the other children, even though he was not the oldest. He said that when he would go in to wake up his mother, he learned to turn his back a certain way to absorb the majority of the blows. Can you imagine? Um, the house was extremely filthy. It was overrun with roaches. The children had lice multiple times. Uh, the children were known as the stinky kids in school. I'm sure we all went to school with kids like that, only to know that, um, yeah, it's not always their fault. And kids can be very cruel. So you can imagine how much crap these children took at school. Um, one day, Gary returned to the house. Uh, he got into an argument with Pamela, and eventually took an axe, busted his way into the door, narrowly missing Travis with the axe as Travis was behind the door, kind of trying to keep him out, and uh, basically shoved Pamela to the floor and began to chop up their very meager belongings, what they did have. Now, as you can imagine, um, they were on public assistance. Public assistance doesn't go very far. And they could not, especially when the mother is taking the majority, majority of it to feed a vice. And they ended up being evicted 
from their house and they ended up going to their aunt's, their mother's sister's house to stay. She would not let them stay in the house, but she did give them shelter in the form of a truck camper that was four by five feet that was uh, parked on an old truck in her backyard next to her garage where her washer and dryer were. Uh, the washer was not uh, hooked into the water or the sewer, or the sewer pipe was not hooked into the washer where it could drain. So whenever she used the washer, it would flood the yard. So the first five feet in front of their camper was always a river. And so Travis remembers having to sleep basically on top of his brothers and sisters in this camper with his mother passed out the majority of the time. Now this camper was not hooked in to any sort of electricity. So there was no, if you've ever seen a truck camper, it's not like a full size camper that you can put on a one ton truck. We're not talking that type of camper that has, you know, bedrooms and kitchens and a nice one. We're talking about a flatbed truck with a camper camper top on it. So there was absolutely nothing in there, but it would keep the rain off of them. And so it was very hot, uh, no air conditioning. Luckily they were in California, so maybe the cold really was an issue. But as you can imagine, um, she did not feed the children properly. Even in that camper, they got lice. Uh, they often ate uh, moldy food because as Pamela was passed out most of the time it was up to Travis to feed the family to feed the other kids because his older brothers would you know take off and go elsewhere so it was literally up to uh, him to take care of the other children however because no one had ever taken the time to train Travis and how to prepare food or look at food he didn't even know how to use a can opener to open cans of food like beans or you know even canned meat so they often ended up eating whatever was convenient, whatever was around, and that included spoiled lunch meat, moldy bread, things of that nature. Count your blessings, folks. We have no idea what's going on behind closed doors sometimes. His only refuge, the children's only refuge from the literal hell that they lived in was when Pamela would sober herself up enough and clean them all up enough by, you know, asking their, her sister if they could actually use their, you know, her bathroom and they would get all get baths and showers and put on clean clothes and go to visit her granddad who had a nice home about two hours away. And while they were there, they would spend, you know, a couple of weeks with him in the summer, some in the winter, and those were among the best times that Travis said he remembers because the grandfather would take them out to eat. He would uh, play with them, but when he played with them, he taught them something. He, would he taught them to spell, to read, to write, to do basic arithmetic, because, you know, if you're a kid in school who's literally starving and worried about the fact that you stink and you have on dirty clothes, you're not learning. So their education was vastly wanting, and their grandfather would try his best to teach them while he was there. And their mother, Pam, was so delusional and so messed out that she actually thought she was fooling her father, that her father had no idea of the state of his daughter and grandchildren. And he knew he would tell the kids they were special and not to give in to what was happening to them. Now, of course, I'm sure what some of you are wondering why the grandfather did just take the kids away. I, I don't know the answer to that. Surely they would have been much better off um, if he had, but I suspect he probably gave them the financial support to the other set of grandparents, the paternal grandparents that would eventually take the children in and raise them. I suspect he probably was giving money and financial support to them as well. Can't prove it, but just the type of person that he appeared to be. In the research that I did, I can't imagine he wasn't partially behind supporting them in, in their later years. So that gave Travis hope, and Travis began to see that maybe there was hope until he was back home in that little trunk camper, and his mother 
had given him a very severe beating, and he started praying. He They weren't raised very religious, but he um, believed in a God, and so he, after his mother had given him a very severe beating and passed out, he spent 30, 45 minutes, an hour, loudly wailing in prayer just outside the camper to God to please have his grandmother, that is his father's mother, come get him. And he was wailing so loud that he woke Pam up. Pam came out and beat him. And he was he's about six at this time. Beat him again. But somebody heard his prayers and Norma, his father's mother, came to get him and took him to her house for the weekend. Again, I'm sure you're wondering why the grandparents didn't intervene. I don't know. It was the 80s. Maybe it just wasn't done at that time. But when he was eight... He ran away to his grandparents, Norma and Jim, and told them he was living with them now, and they, without a word, took him in. Eventually, he was followed by his other seven siblings, and their fathers, stepfather, and mother, Jim Sarby and Norma Sarby, took them in. Uh, Norma would be known as Mum Mum, and they were devout members of the LDS Church. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, otherwise known as the Mormons. I sort of realized this was another Mormon-affiliated case when I took it over, much like the Daybells, but it didn't really click until I was into it. So I just want to know, I'm, I'm not obsessed with the Mormon religion. That is not why I'm doing this. It just happens there's been some crimes with people associated with the LDS Church. So, uh, they took the children to their church. They fully immersed them in LDS beliefs, and it ended up being a great stabilizing factor, especially for Travis. Travis delved headfirst into it. He literally devoured everything that he could about the Mormon church. He took on, he read the Book of Mormon. He read the Bible. He was very inquisitive in Bible school and took it very, very seriously. He wanted to go do a mission as soon as he was old enough. I mean, he really took to the Mormon religion. All the rules, all of the everything that, it, from you know, no premarital sex, to no caffeine, to no addicting substances, to honoring your father and your mother, all the good, all the things that the Mormon church, there's a lot of rules associated with the Mormon church. So, he took to that discipline very well. It was the type of discipline he had never had in his life. And with Jim and Norma leading the way and disciplining the kids at home, he really grew and blossomed. And he would have to be tough in character because at in uh, 2005, his mother Pam was found dead of a methamphetamine overdose. So rest in peace, Pam. I'm sorry you didn't get the, the help that you needed. Um... He was baptized at age 10 in the Mormon church, So, and at 16, he became an elder. And he was very well equipped to handle his mother's death, and he helped the other children handle it as well. Uh, because he was, like I said, he wasn't the oldest, but he was kind of the stabilizing force among the siblings. Uh, as you can imagine, his high school career was much better than his elementary or his junior high because he was no longer the smelly kid. He was just a kid. Uh, he came out of his shell. He wasn't so reserved. He was very popular. He ran for student class president. He uh, joined the wrestling team and uh, excelled at it. He was very handsome, so he had no shortage of girls that wanted to date him. He was just a very popular kid, very interested in politics. He started doing debate club and other things that would could possibly lead to a uh, a career in uh, in politics, and at this time, father his father Gary actually came back into the into the picture. He had gone into rehab. He cleaned up his life. He'd gotten a job, and he came back and stayed with his parents for a while, and had a very good relationship with his kids. He also became involved in the Mormon Church, and things were looking up for the Alexander family. In 1995, he graduated from high school and served two years as he wanted to on a mission in Denver, Colorado. He um, went door to door with uh, his uh, his mission partner and preached to uh, anybody that would listen about the Mormon church. He 
was very um very into it. He he the discipline that his that Jim and Norma had taught him along with the discipline taught in the Mormon church excelled him to get on a routine even when he was on his mission and he could have easily slacked off because there's not as much supervision. But he basically had an entire day mapped out. He kind of encouraged his mission partner to go by that schedule as well. So his day, written in his memoirs, was like this. He would rise at 6. He would do 30 to 45 minutes of exercise. He would eat his breakfast. He would study the Book of Mormon for at least a half hour. And then he and his partner would get on their bicycles and their suits. And they would go door to door proselytizing all day. He was still on his mission when he got word from Norma and Jim that his father, Gary, unfortunately had been killed in a car accident. He was only gone for a couple of weeks from his mission. He flew home. He attended the funeral. He comforted his siblings. He comforted his grandparents. And then he was right back on the mission two weeks later. This according to interviews by with Hiram Nichols, who was his mission partner at the time, and Hiram was quoted as saying he was by far the most devoted missionary in our entire group. After completing his mission, he actually moved to Provo, Utah and enrolled in BY Brigham Young University, BYU Provo. His entire mindset now was to do three things. Pursue politics and become independently wealthy. I don't know if those two were tied, but that was one of his goals. He would marry in the Mormon tradition, both here and celestially. At, because, you know, if, if you, you can marry, and then you can also be sealed in the church to show that you will be, you know, spouses not only here on earth, but also in your next life. So that was his goal, to marry here and celestially and raise a family in the Mormon tr tradition. So those were his goals. Uh, at Provo, at Provo, he studied politics, but and lived with uh, three male roommates in Provo. However, he eventually realized that college was not for him. He felt that the um, financial pressure of student loans and things like that were not good for his eventual goals. So he eventually dropped out and moved back to California near Riverside, where his grandparents were. Once returning to Riverside, he also found three three roommates. I don't know if he had something about the number three, but he had three roommates and worked a series of jobs, all trying to find his path toward his goals. A Mormon family, independently wealthy, and politics. So while there, he worked a variety of jobs. He was a telemarketer. He was a drug abuse counselor or a drug abuse counselor's aide at a, a local rehab. I understand why he would have an affinity for that. And he also worked for an uh, Allstate insurance agent selling car policies for the main agent. I used to do that myself, except I worked for a State Farm agent simply selling life policies out of his office. He did the same thing for an Allstate agent, except it was car insurance. And he drove a 10-year-old Honda Civic. So unlike Chad Daybell's Nissan, he liked Hondas. So according to his best friend, Deanna, who was also a Mormon, um, he was uh, very, very dedicated. Um, they dated, but decided they were better friends, but they did maintain a very chaste relationship because maintaining his Mormon morality was very, very Im important to him. They were both members of the Riverside Singles Ward. Uh, Mormon churches are divided into wards by city or neighborhood, and there are specifically singles wards for young singles. Now, I think they're grouped by age. Once you hit like 30 or 32, you may, you may be moved up to an older group, but you know, you had singles 18 to 30. Now, the vast majority of Mormon youth marry right after their mission or in college, so they are usually married by late teens, early 20s. So to have somebody in their mid-20s to especially 30s still single in the Mormon church is very, very unusual. Um, Deanna often said that uh, he was a great force for the Mormon church, even though he was living a life with three roommates. Three of them were not, they were not Mormon, so, but he still managed to proselytize for his religion wherever he would go. Deanna remembers a time when he actually counseled one of her roommates 
who was the only uh, Mormon on the Cal State Riverside's volleyball team. And uh, he would basically talk to her about how she could spread the Mormon faith even while playing volleyball. So by the age of 23, he was still working at least two jobs at a time, but he was starting to have serious financial issues. Uh, by the year 2000, he could not make rent. And not only that, he was deeply in credit card debt because he had used his um, credit cards to pay his bills because he couldn't make he couldn't make it on his paycheck so he was using credit cards to pay his bills and they were they were gradually running up he had like 10 maxed out credit cards and could not qualify for any more credit so he couldn't pay his part of the rent so he was evicted uh, he ended up living on couches for a while sleeping in his car and that coupled with a near-death experience he had later that year when he and some friends were having dinner at a San Bernardino, California restaurant. And if you know about San Bernardino, also about two hours away from L.A. It's kind of on the border of several, of a couple of states. And basically, uh, not such a nice area. It's, it's kind of crime-ridden. And they were eating in a San Bernardino restaurant when... An armed assailant with a mask came in and basically demanded everyone get on the floor and he went from person to person asking for their wallets. When he got to Travis, he pointed the gun at Travis's head and said, give me your wallet. Well, Travis didn't have a wallet. He just had cash in his pocket. He had no credit cards because they were all maxed out. So he basically gave the cash, his watch, anything else of any value he had in his pockets and gave it to the to the robber. The robber did not believe he didn't have a wallet. He believed this person was holding out on credit cards and things like that. And Travis said, went while the thief was screaming at him, he saw his life flash in front of his head. He said he kind of turned to the left and saw a woman under a nearby table that was just sobbing. And then he closed his eyes and was just waiting for death to take him because he had, he said he didn't have a wallet to give the, the person. And he said, but before he was killed, he kind of felt, felt an angel on his shoulder. And a man underneath the table nearby kind of pitched a wallet at the, at the thief and said, here, take mine. He's not lying. He doesn't have one. And the thief grabbed that wallet, finished going around, cleaning out everybody, and ran off. Can you imagine, age 23, you're living on people's couches, sleeping in your car, and then you just go to have a bite to eat one day and someone puts a gun to your head. Can you imagine? Unlike me and other people who would have used that as an excuse to become even more of a hermit than I already am and curled up in the fetal position and given up for a couple of years when that happened, he used it as fuel to get where he needed to be. He realized, he said, in that moment that he was wasting his life. He was working a mall job as well as various telemarketing jobs, could not even afford a place to live. And here he was now, his life could have ended and what legacy would he be living? So he leaving, so he used that as fuel to pick up and move on with his life, which if you know what he ended up doing for a living later on, which we're about to talk about, it was very, very fitting. That was the fuel to his fire. It was from that moment on that he started reading self-help books. Uh, any, any motivational book he could get his hands on, no, Tony Robbins, any of that stuff, you know, he, he devoured it. And he realized that he had an affinity for that kind of stuff. He would tell his friends about it. He would tell Deanna about it. He, would, he realized he had an affinity and a love for teaching others. And he decided that he needed to fill his head with nothing but positive thoughts. He was able to get a raise at one of his jobs, so he was able to finally get an apartment and a place to, a place to live with a couple other roommates. He started wanting more. He woke up every morning and took a three by five index cards and wrote five to six things that he had to accomplish in that day. It doesn't matter how, how small or how large, whether it's pay the utility bills, clean the apartment, uh, uh, 
put in an hour of overtime at work, call Deanna, call uh, my grandparents, whatever it may be, he wrote it on that card. And if he accomplished all six things before he went to bed, he would add a seventh thing and make sure it was done. That's how he lived his life. Very disciplined. He would accomplish his goals. He would try to sell at work and be the best of the best. He prayed, he exercised, he read self-help books, he read a scripture every day from both the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And he learned that early rise and late to bed was the way to go. He was up by five or six in the morning and sometimes would not go to bed till after midnight. Oh, to be 23 again. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I'm asleep by 8.30 now. And I sleep till six or seven, so there you go. <laughs> Not only that, he immersed himself even more into the Mormon church. He started going to other churches, except he would he would kind of move out of the singles ward in Riverside, and he actually started going to the very large Mormon temple, one of the older in the in the country, in Los Angeles. And he was very active in the church. He was very enthusiastic in Bible school. He also would help the church. He would make it a point every day when he was there or every service when he was there he would go around to all the rooms and gather up the trash and take it out to the dumpster and of course the mormon elder started to notice oh this is a very industrious young man and one of the most well-known men in the church was a man named chris hughes and he took an interest in travis's what he thought was you know get up and go kind of attitude and Chris was one of the elder Sunday school teachers, and he, in one of the classes that Travis was a part of, he read a story by a man named Dr. Livingston Harney that was about letting go of regret. And because Travis read so much of, of books by successful people, in addition to his self-help stuff, he recognized that that was actually a story written by Dale Carnegie, and that he had read in, in a Dale Carnegie book or a memoir. And so he started chatting with Chris after the, after the lesson and told him that. And Chris knew that as well. And he was just amazed that this kid knew, you know, such an obscure story written by, you know, Carnegie. And so they started uh, talking weekly, daily. And he got really close with Chris and his wife, Skye, who would, pay, who would play an integral part in his life. Um, and Chris felt that perhaps God was sending Travis to him to help him with his business, which he had been in for a while. And this is where doors started to open for Travis. Now, this business wasn't a business that Chris had started. He was a representative for a company called Prepaid Legal Services, now called Legal Shield. They changed their name at some point in the after 2010, I think around 2011. Prepaid Legal Services is a multi-level marketing company founded in 1972 in Ada, Oklahoma uh, by a man named Harlan Stonecipher. And ironically, Jody Arias had her picture made with Mr. Stonecipher at a conference because, you, as you know, that's how they met. She was a rep for prepaid legal services too and just i know it's kind of out of place here but i wanted to mention that because i don't really mention mr stone cipher later on so i'm going to drop that here the premise of prepaid legal was that it sold yearly legal insurance contracts to people these were contracts that would eventually pay for a, essentially pay for a lawyer in the event you got into legal trouble now there's been a lot of problems associated with now what is now called Legal Shield. A lot of uh, lawsuits, particularly in uh, I think 2002, by the Wyoming um, Wyoming attorneys general actually sued them because their plans really weren't doing what they said they would do, and they found they were a scam, as most multi-level marketing is. Uh, but that wasn't the case. This was way before any of those lawsuits. And prepaid legal was actually one of the more profitable MLMs for its reps. Now, I'm not saying they all made a living. The vast majority of MLM people barely make any money at all if they don't lose money. But this is what Chris Hughes was doing. He was, you know, as you know, multi-level marketing, they sell a product. That's what kind of separates them from pyramid schemes. But 
their main thing is to recruit because the commission structure you make off of the product isn't really enough to uh, make a huge living unless you are the world's best salesperson. I mean, you're, you're selling thousands of dollars a day. You might be able to make a, you know, a suitable living off just selling the products. No. The main thing that you're there to do is recruit people under you so that you can get them to sell the product and you get commissions off of what they sell. In addition to anybody they recruit, you get commissions there. And that's how you, that's how you make a lot of money in these MLMs. Well, Chris Hughes had a team already working under him and he felt God was sending Travis into an MLM. So he started talking to Travis about what a prepaid legal services did and, and does. And Travis signed up, uh, after, um, Chris took him to a seminar where he got to see all the motivational speakers. Now, I'm going to drop a clip here of a prepaid legal service convention. Uh, all their conventions and seminars are very much like that. They do them in exotic places like Hawaii and Las Vegas, Cancun, Mexico, New York, California, you know, Los Angeles. They do them in very, you know, trendy exotic locations to bring more people in and at these places you see their own brand of motivational speaker people that have clawed their way to the top of the company and are making a lot of money they give motivational speakers well as you can imagine this was like music to travis's ear because he was already very much a fan fanboy of motivational speakers so when chris invited him and he got to see these types of motivational speakers he was hooked and he signed up with prepaid legal but i'm going to drop that clip here this is from a 2007 prepaid legal conference the guy on stage i believe is the founder harlan stone cipher the young man next to him i thought it was travis it might be i could not find a name so let me know down below if you actually think that's travis alexander i don't know i thought it might be but i'm gonna drop that here <laughs> Travis immediately paid his enrollment fees because in most MLMs you have to pay a fee to even join. He paid his enrollment fees, he got his training materials, he started devouring them immediately, and he just started cold calling people that he thought, or calling people in his immediate network that he thought might benefit from a legal, a legal contract and essentially co closed three sales his first week, which is very unusual, especially for selling this type of product. A lot, well, I'm gonna say this, this type of MLM falls into the same stereotypes as a lot of insurance companies. I know in Alabama, there's there was a couple of small regional life insurance companies and they recruited salespeople with the intent of them selling to their immediate network, their friends and their family MLMs kind of work on the same premise, especially ones that are insurance company like. You sell to your immediate friends and family and they give you hopefully they give you referrals to sell more. But after you've sold to everyone you know and you can't make any most more sales, they usually let end up letting you go. So um unless you are, you know, the referrals keep coming, which is not usually the case. So Travis started reaching out to everyone that he knew and ended up selling to three of his friends and or family. So he was able to quit two of his three jobs that he held down at the time. He quit the telemarketing job and he quit, I believe he was still selling car insurance at the time. He quit those, but he kept his job at the mall because he had had that the longest. He actually enjoyed being out in the public and seeing the sights at the mall. I mean, this is, you know, early 2000s. I remember as a kid loving to go to the mall. It's not really a thing anymore. 
But the mall was a cool place to be right up until maybe 2010, 2011. So he loved being at the mall. He loved to integration. He liked his job, but uh, he decided also security because what the sales thing doesn't work out. Well, one morning he actually made $400 in commission in one 30 minute session because he sold a bunch of contracts to a small business and one to the boss, one to all the managers, and then he sold kind of a universal group policy to the, to the business itself. So in 30 minutes, a 30 minute call, he made $400 in commission. But as a result of that call, he was late to his mild job. He was running in the door. His boss pretty much got in his face and started screaming at him about how he was late and how that, that was unacceptable. Well, Travis, I guess, was having a, was already kind of up on closing a $400 worth of commission in 30 minutes, as anyone would be. And he just wasn't taking it from his boss this day. And he turned to the boss and says, yes, and I'll be 30 minutes late for the rest of my time with you because I'm a good salesman and I've got what it takes. Well, of course, that didn't sit right with the boss and he was fired on the spot. <sighs> At 24 years of age. So, of course, he immediately left. He called Chris. He told Chris what just happened and Chris says, this is phenomenal. This is God kicking you out of the nest, young man. You're ready to expand your business. You're great at selling the product, but how great are you at recruiting? It's time for you to make some real money. $400 will seem like pocket change to you if you start recruiting people. And so Chris put him on in the training materials to recruit agents to actually work underneath him. Now, roughly on the plans that you sold, you would, you know, earn anywhere from $100 to $138 per policy that you sold. Remember, these were policies to pay for lawyers in the event of legal trouble. And so he was selling uh, about five plans a week himself, as well as talking to other people about it. And he started to recruit some people to work under him. So now he would get a commission, I'll bet smaller, off everything they sold. His claim to fame was he was one of like the highest sellers of the product in the company within his first year. He sold to everyone. He networked in LA. He sold to a lot of people in the LDS church. And he also sold a policy to the actor that played Barney, the purple dinosaur. There's actually a picture out there of that. So I'm not going to put it here on this, but if you want to look that up, he's out there where he just sold a policy to the actor that played Barney, the dinosaur. And, um, so basically, started to, he was the top salesman of the product. He was recruiting a lot of people. However, California was becoming oversaturated with uh, prepaid legal service people. And Travis thought there might be a better option because he also felt he was competing with Chris, even though he, Chris is making money off him, so Chris doesn't care. But he felt that California was pretty dang saturated. So he decided he was going to move to another market that didn't have as many reps in it and hopefully kind of make more of a name for himself. Well, he moved to Mesa, Arizona, which was a suburb of Phoenix that was founded by Brigham Young's uh, group in the 1870s. It was mostly LDS. And in 2004, he moved there. And he joined the Desert Ridge Singles Ward and started making plans to make Mesa his home. While there, he would attend several social events weekly. There was a family night home evening on Monday where um, groups of young uh, single Mormons would get together at either a home or a local venue and study the Book of Mormon. And it was at one of those he met Michelle Lowry, who would end up being another good friend of his. Um, he kidded her. She was 18, but he kidded her and said, oh, you look 13. They became close, like big brother, little sister. He, you know, she would end up being a great friend of him. In fact, one of the friends that would later find his body on that tragic uh, afternoon. Uh, he was well liked. He was popular. He showed his emotions freely, uh, just like he did in the L.A. temple. He would help clean the church after every uh, service because he was so well liked he was able to sell a lot of prepaid legal policies as well as recruit a lot of people to work under him 
and he rose through uh, the ranks to be the number two uh, executive in the um, prepaid legal services umbrella uh, within a year. He also was invited by the owner, Harlan himself, to become a motivational speaker for the company, and they invited him to many conferences and team meetings where he would become the motivational speaker on stage. Later in 2004, he was making big bucks, as well as uh, kind of giving himself a lifestyle that reflected that. He designed um, his own clothing. He would have a tailor make it. He liked bold colors, really bright, bright colors to draw attention to himself. He bought himself a nice BMW and eventually his house on Queensboro. Queensboro Boulevard in Mesa, Arizona. He put a $10,000 down payment with the builder who was building uh, these uh, these huge subdivisions outside of Phoenix, and he bought a whopping uh, single-family home that had two, uh, four bedrooms, two baths, uh, a sitting room, a bonus room, a pool, all the amenities you can imagine for an executive on his way up. He, he bought this house for $259,000, which you couldn't probably find a shack outside Phoenix, Arizona for that now. But got to remember, this is 2004. We're in the middle of the original real estate bubble where, you know, people are lending money to anybody that wants a house. And so he was able to get in on that and secure himself a nice house. Uh, one of the most important aspects of the house was his closet. He wanted it to be completely walk-in and organized into sections where he could hang his very nice clothes, fold his very nice clothes, and it would connect to his bathroom. This will become important later on. He also uh, had a loft where two of the bedrooms were, and in that loft he had a full-size movie screen and projector where he would host MMA. He was a huge UFC MMA fight, uh, fan. He would host game nights, movie nights for his Mormon friends and friends from prepaid legal. It was the place to be, but Travis ever frugally knew that he didn't need that much house on his own. It was more of an investment for him. So he actually rented out two rooms in the house to roommates to save money. He would work from his home office, which was also his den. He would host these movie nights and group events for prepaid legal services at his home. He would host some of the singles ward events. He also started traveling a lot with the Chris and Sky Hughes to all these conferences and these exotic locations like Bahamas, uh, Hawaii, back to California, New York, all over. And he became very sought after to speak because he would get a speaker's fee for these as well. So he was really doing quite well. He had gotten to the point that his business essentially ran itself. He was recruited to the Bram and as long as his uh, agents were closing sales. He was making money, so he had gotten to the point that his business really ran itself, and he only had to de devote about two to three hours a day to sales calls himself to either sell policies or recruit more people. So he was able to look for other business ventures, and this is where he met a good friend of his. One of his recent um, prepaid legal recruits, a uh, young man attending Arizona State University, majoring in accounting, named Taylor Surrow had an idea for his own clothing brand. Taylor, also a uh, devoted Mormon, was kind of upset by how women dressed, you know, very revealing. So he had come up with a modest female clothing brand named CAF, which actually was an, uh, a reversed acronym for basically stopping the... It's, it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's hard for me to explain. But basically, this is a... a, a a clothing line that was to stop the unneeded showing of female flesh. Um, calf was the name of it, and uh, their slogan was, it's more than a shirt, it's a quest. And Travis was instantly hooked on this idea with his good friend Taylor, and because Taylor was a student, didn't have enough time to devote to it, Travis did most of the grunt work from building the website to doing the marketing and ended up selling about 500, uh, 500 shirts a month online as a result of Travis's hard work. Uh, he also developed a comedy type character named Eddie Snow, uh, an agent from Alabama that was Travis's alter ego that he used as kind of a uh, comedy skit when he did his motivational speaking. You know, uh, 
Eddie would speak in a very exaggerated Southern accent and do all the things that uh, Travis would never do on stage. He became sort of a mini celebrity and prepaid legal, uh, as well as his friends would often say that he was uniquely generous. He would often sneak around and pay for group things, pay for things for the church, just uh, the type of person that everyone loved. He was also extremely flirty with females, even though at this now marriage was the furthest thing from his mind now that his career was taking off. And um, in July 2006, uh, his house had uh, grown to a worth of over $300,000. So he decided to refinance it for a lower interest rate and pulled out $75,000 to put in savings, finish decorating it, as well as put into the book he was writing called Raising You. And that was based on him having to be the parent to his other children, as you can imagine. Um, so he was using this money to kind of further his career, in addition to still traveling and hanging out with Chris and Skye. Um, around this time, one of his brothers actually stole his identity, and he was arrested and had to prove his innocence. So. He used his own prepaid legal contract to be able to fight that and get that expunged. Um, he also got his brother the help that he needed, and he used the story on stage to talk about the important, and in his sales pitches to talk about how important prepaid legal insurance is to people. He uh, would also come up with very weird and funny sayings that people referred to as Travis's, Travisisms, and he... In 2006, he did eventually get involved in political campaigns. Uh, he campaigned for Arizona Proposition 204 that refused to allow uh, animals raised for food to be treated, treated cruelly. He also adopted Napoleon, his little black pug. He wore a silver promise ring on his finger to show that he was chaste and would uh, be celibate until marriage, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, he did have sexual relations with a few girls, including Deanna, his friend from uh, his college, you know, post-college days. Um, but they had a mandate about that. Um, according to Travis and other people interviewed for this book, uh, everything but vaginal sex was kind of allowed. Only vaginal sex was considered intercourse, so that's how they got around it. So let's just say Travis was an everything but boy. I uh, knew a lot of anything but girls at the Baptist College I went to, so it happens. Uh, he wanted, but by age 30, he really felt he was becoming an anomaly in the Mormon church, not being married. So he began actually thinking about getting married and looking around. And he was going to be very selective, unfortunately not selective enough as it would happen. And with that, I'm going to end part one of Travis Alexander and Jody Arias. I know this is kind of long drawn out, but I just wanted to give you an insight into the two key players in this case. When I come back tomorrow, we'll be talking about Jody Arias herself. So with that being said, I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, Keto Comic.